Interesting. Hello, and we are live on the launch and taking your property investing to the next level. How are you going today, Jane? I am wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's it's an absolute pleasure. Like it's it's thank you for coming on. It's it's fantastic to get some of your caliber on the show and just to sort of just to really understand what your what your insights and your wisdom and your knowledge is. So I'm I'm excited and the audience should be throwing the cons the comments, the questions and any sort of thoughts because I know there's gonna be a lot of that and there's gonna be a lot of back and forth. So how are you, Joe? Mr Mr. Joe Tucker. How are you going? Mate, I'm well. I'm 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 enjoying your background now. We've got a little bit bit more to see than just the blank wall. I've got the uh, I've got the amazing picture. You've got that, Jane. Jane's got amazing curtain set up. We're we're a professional outfit here, I tell you. It's only taken us like yeah, it's only taken us a year to do it. Like what, what, what was it? I was thinking about it today. I was like I was looking about it a couple of days. Ago. Why don't I just turn desk around and I have this fantastic background, which is yeah. <laughs> I have, yeah. I have to say, I thought I was going to be pulling down the caliber of the show by not ironing the background, but I'm okay. No. <laughs> Looks like it's a wall. It's, it's a yeah. solid wall. Oh, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Fear, fear no more. But I'm very excited. Jeff, how are you today, mate? Yeah, man, I, I was. Uh, the Aussies are absolutely belting the cricket. So whenever that's happening, it's a good day, Joe. It's a good day. I know people might not be cricket fans, but I, I absolutely am. So. Um, was loving that, but also just was quite productive in the second half of the afternoon. So second half of the afternoon, how many how many halves mm-hmm. of the afternoon are there? So there's only one. So second half of the day. So really, really good, loving it. And just uh, I bounce into these Wednesday not, Wednesday night conversations. So I'm good, and I'm keen to get to the quote of the week. Which um, let's let's get our let's let our guests go first because that's the that's the thing to do. Let's do it. Well, my a quote of the week is rust never sleeps. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would it totally will agree. Rust. Later, it will make sense later. <laughs> oh wow! Rust, so we know, yeah, rust, no one knows what that means. But, Russ can't yeah. sleep. Okay. Well, give us a little hint. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> well, so it's funny because I was working with my mentor in the last couple of weeks, and I was saying, you know, you really have to be so vigilant and on your vision and not lose focus. And, you know, otherwise, you know, everything just kind of gets you down and, and you know, the world with um, all the, the things that you just have to do with your day-to-day life. But if you hold to your vision, you know, and really set some, some guideposts on how you're going to create things during the day, then, you know, you're really on top of it. But if you just step back for a, a, a moment or you let doubts or whatever it is enter your mindset the rust creeps in because rust never sleeps. Oh, I like oh, it. Well, it's such a, that, that was the hint, but I mean, that, that was probably more than, you know, I think you just explained it. So uh, that's, that's, I have so much more. <laughs> I love it. What is yours, Jeff? What have you got for us today? Okay. So mine's kind of, I don't even, I think this is an original, so it might not make any oh, sense, God. but I, I was saying to, my quote of the week is time is the only currency we will not be able to make any make or find any more of. So it, okay. it's kind of it's kind of deep. The reason I would say that is because everybody's sort of worried about oh you can't get money or there's all these sort of things that or, all these mm. op- or networking all those kind of things. But those things are, are, are infinite. You, you can always do more networking. You can all, I suppose and the thing that you can't create more of is time. So I think that's. Um, because we often, we times we do things that uh, we do so many things, and we just we we don't respect our own time. So I wanted mm. to put that mm. message out there. Mm. Mm. Very good point. There you go. Happy days. That makes sense. Hey, I'm I'm all for it. I'm all about saving time. Um, so I'm going to be quick and brief with mine. Um, so my quote of the week is by Napoleon Bonaparte. He has a whole heap of amazing uh, amazing quotes, but this one is. The greatest danger occurs at the moment of victory. Um, And I guess that that is around complacency, right? It's like right towards the end of the line and you get complacent. So from a property perspective, I thought this one was quite nice because I can start to see people buying anything. Like they're buying Mm -hmm. assets and properties that they haven't done their due diligence on. They're they're waiving their right for a a cooling off period. They're just jumping straight into properties. And that's a 2021 thing that you can do and get away with it. But I don't think it's going to be a 2022 thing that you're going to be. I I don't know if you can ever get away with it, Joe. I mean, can you? I mean, no. Not not in the long term. That's a good point. Not in the long term. So I love that one. 
You know what? Another quote that comes to me. Can I throw a second in? You can. You're allowed. You, Next week. You hear, you hear everyone say, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. Well, yeah, yeah. on your point, Joe, we're at that part in the market at the moment where the tide's going out and we're actually getting to see what the reality is. So we're in a, a, mm-hmm. an, a, an incredible time in history where all markets rose and now we get yeah. to see in relation to each other in the entire same economic cycle, which ones are going to really perform and which ones won't. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Well, how do we spot the right ones? That's the, that's the question. Not, not for right now, I guess, but um, we'll get to that, I'm sure. Mm. Let's do it. Okay, great. Well, let's jump into our first sponsor, and then we will introduce this wonderful lady that we've got here. Let's do this button. Too slow, Jack. Too slow. What do you mean? <laughs> because... Selling a property, it isn't something we do every single day. There's actually more involved in the process than you may initially think. Like, how do you find the best agent? How do you ensure that you're going to pay the lowest fees? It's not easy. And then also throw in all the stress and pressure of selling. And that's why Scott Agate, a former real estate agent and expert property negotiator from Hallow House, has created his leading agent finder service. After a 20-year career managing agents himself, Scott has personally conducted over 3,000 property transactions along with running Three Bell franchises. He knows all these agent tricks. Scott has created an in-depth five-step process for his leading agent finder service. First, he establishes the true market value for your property, uses a triangulation method to shortlist the leading agents, creates a competitive environment for those agents to send through their best proposals, vets those proposals, and then he negotiates the best agent fees for you. This ensures that you're not only getting the best rate for selling, but most importantly, you have a leading agent on your side selling your property to maximize the end sale value. Oh, and did I mention, this service is completely free. If you'd like to know exactly how Scott runs his five-step leading agent finder service, he's detailed it with the link below. Or if you'd like to speak with Scott to help find you the leading agent in your area, book a call today. Selling a property. It isn't something we do. There we go. You know, That's a really Scott, cool. Scott's just done that for three of my clients, Geraldton, Cairns, and Gladstone. Like insane okay. service. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to unpack Gladstone because Gladstone's a, yeah, we sort of, yeah, even sort of these mining towns and I'm, I'm actually going to do something really, I mean, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but uh, Gladstone, what, what was the, uh, can I just ask, what was the, we'll introduce you, but I want to know first, what was the purpose of the reason uh, in, in the person selling Gladstone? Was it, what did they yeah, first Yeah, um, one of many purchases that were done in a, a with, investment companies that got them into uh, mining towns and this was a yeah. vacant block of land lng Ooh. plant you know t- takes a thousand people to build the plant two people to turn the switch on after everyone leaves and it's built and uh, the fallout to that was it didn't sustain the property prices and was a portfolio yeah. killer in the in the portfolio that was just eating borrowing capacity and actually you know churning through the cash flow so it just had to go <clears throat> yeah but um, but yeah, I think I think that there is starting to see some green shoots. But I, I think I, I don't. Uh, I caution. I'm, I'm not saying people should buy. They shouldn't buy there. There's no recommendations here. But I just sort of see people say, "Oh yeah, there's all these kind of positives." I'm like, "Well, have you actually seen what that what those particular markets can can and will probably do again?" Not not saying they will, but Murrumbah, for example, or even Port Hedland. I mean, I sort of I was looking at median prices for those mm-hmm. places. From 12 the other day but th- that's uh does tells into you though you are I was, I was listening to somebody talk talk about yourself and you you so people who don't know jane i don't know how you don't know jane but you are you are an author a podcaster of of an awesome podcast media commentator property coach mortgage broker the year twice and and even a top financial influ- influencer of Qantas. But the thing that I love about you, though, is that you are about helping everyday Aussies kind of to achieve to achieve financial freedom through the your 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 property six your I think it's your property success. Yeah, I was going to say your success secret, but um, so to me, that's 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 the exciting, most exciting thing about you. But and the thing I want to kind of ask you though that we maybe this could, this is a scary question what is something that people um don't know about you that's um that, yeah what is something that people don't know about you oh uh, look you know i've been talking about myself for like 15 years so i'm pretty sure there's no secrets um mm-hmm. some people who may not have um you know seen anything on me 
uh, may not know I was an explosives engineer, mining engineer oh. for 20 years. And um, I ooh, first girl to work underground in coal mines when it became legal in 1989 in New South Wales. All the, all the operators went out on strike and I managed to uh, bring them back. I came from a farm, right? Everyone just had to pitch in. There really wasn't any girls did this, boys did that. If you someone had to, you know, plough a field, you just jump on the tractor. So it was kind of foreign to me where you turn up underground, they go, no, you know, you, mm. would, you would expect that you can't work. I'm like, really? Hmm, I wish you mm. told my dad that. <laughs> 1989 was a great year for many reasons. That That, that is one of them. Um, there's, there's an older couple. Isn't that age me now, right, Jeff? <laughs> no, I think it's the year Jeff was born. <laughs> yeah. There you go. He's aged me. My, my Joe turned 51 two weeks ago. So, you know, rocking the next half century. At least, yeah, raise right, right, right the time. So, and you'll be educating, I'm sure, until at least another 40, 45 years. So what, what I want to say, the, the other first sort of question we ask people is, tell us about your first purchase. So what was the what was the purpose behind it and, and how did it go? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, as I said, I was a mining engineer and I was really, you know, I was 28, 29, footloose, fancy free. And my husband, my now husband, my boyfriend there was like, you know, there's something in this property thing, you know, we really should check it out. You know, he had had a property in New Zealand and um, my parents have never owned their own home. Like my dad was a farm worker who just used to go working from farm to farm and a house would come with the job, right? So, yeah. um, and and we, we kind of started, you know, looking into it. And my boss used to say to me, I can't wait for you to get a mortgage because it means that you're stuck with me for life. You ca you have to have a job. And I was like, there's no way I'm getting a mortgage. So I only thought you could buy a home, right? White picket fence. And um, and Todd's like, no, no, you know, there's something more to this. And he'd been mowing someone's lawn on his little lawn mowing business in New Zealand. And this guy was like 25 and had a property. Todd mowed the lawn. He's like, oh, come and do my other properties. I'm like, how do you have like that many properties? And he said, well, the first yeah. one's the hardest. And then you build on that. And so that really, um, and Todd was really motivated by that. And I was being the good engineer and researcher. So I read 120 books on properties. I went to all those two-hour free sessions. And it got to the stage where, so good. you know, they're all the same at, at a point. Everyone says the same things. And, like, you know, I, I got broke and this is how I got out of it. And I lost everything. And this is how I came back. And so I used to take a notebook in. And I used to write down on one side the content and on the other side I started critiquing how they presented and their stories because I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I could learn from this. And then um, I was just like, if I could just write down all the things everyone did wrong, I'll just jump over that and not do it. <laughs> and so I kind of had the list of, you know, don't trust someone else with your money, don't listen to a property spooker, but run to the back of the room and buy my <laughs> blah, blah, off the plan. And so... Um, with that kind of integrity, um, we started to do an, a number of other, you know, courses and listen to people. And there was a guy, I can't remember his name. Oh, I know. Um, what was his name? He used to have like a, down at Queen Victoria Markets, he used to sell like moccasins. And he went, he ended up going to jail for something completely different. But anyhow, he had like this kind of course and I couldn't afford it, but Todd could afford it. So he went off and did this weekend course. And he's like, this guy has like all this methodology and research in how you can find properties and I'd only ever heard of people you know just kind of throwing out you know and then you get a property and you do this there wasn't how to get the property or where to buy the property or what type of property and um and so someone's there who probably in the comments knows who I'm talking about and and so we um he went, he could afford to do the course and he'd wake up to him and go, oh, my gosh, you know, what if we did this? What if this was the twist? What if we did that? And I was a, I was an explosives engineer, right? So everything was yeah. low risk. It was like consequence and likelihood and risk. So if I couldn't de-risk something, I wasn't interested. So I thought, okay, there's got to be a way to do this. So we kind of um, drew a 10-kilometre circle around CBD Melbourne, got rid of 80% of the suburbs we couldn't afford and it was all around that proximity to workplace where people needed to live and, you know, good uh, mm. infrastructure and public transport. And I thought, well, how do I de-risk this? If I, I could de-risk it if I buy the property that most people want. Well, how do I know what most people want? Well, census tells you that, right? So I'm like, okay, I can do that. And what about um, I want to be in an area that has more properties 
um, more people looking for properties than properties for rent. How do I work that out? It's like, well, vacancy rates. And I don't want to be spending all my weekends in an area that there's like three sales a month and 70% of people who are buying are own occupiers buying emotionally. And so I've only got one a month that I'm waiting for. So I want to have a certain number of sales. And then it was like, well, how do I de-risk an area that doesn't have renters if I need to rent? And I thought, well, the general number is like 70% of people own their own homes. There must be like 30% of people who rent. I need to have at least 30% renters. And so that became a very clear criteria. And we just started going to every auction. So if for every auction we went to, we went for one that um, was renovated to a really high level and we checked that out and for every 10 we'd go and check out the rental opens as well to see what people are were talking about in the rental opens you know they've got security or they've got you know caesar stone bench shops or whatever that was so i was kind of like doing yeah. like, the listening to the conversations and then um and so we were doing all of all of that and it got to a point where i was like I still need to de-risk this. And there's 15,655 suburbs in Australia. There must be some that have outperformed the market. And if they've out outperformed the market, what characteristics do they have in common? So I studied them and looked at the 10-year growth because we couldn't get 20-year growth. And we came up with three suburbs. We walked them, went through them, and I was like, I need to have another way to make money. I can't bet on me getting this right just with capital yeah. growth. So renovation was allowing me very quickly to add value. And if I could understand through research what the property was worth, I could negotiate and get it below the market or, you know, secure it before others were, were looking at it and driving the market up. So I can make money now by buying below the market. I could then add renovation to add value and then I could do capital growth. So I had three ways, which became the Trident strategy. So the very first property um, I bought for $425,000 and I had $45,000 in cash, $25,000 went to stamp duty straight up and I had a 5% deposit and I knew if I had waited till I had a 20% deposit, that $400,000 property would be six hundred dollars because it would be four or five years' time and I'd be buying yeah. the equivalent of like two fifty thousand dollars property now. Yeah. So I got it and I took a personal loan for fifty grand, did a strategic renovation of uh, putting – trying to create two dollars for every one dollar that I spent which I had assessed from those high-end valuations or renovations that I looked at and nine months later that four hundred and twenty five thousand dollar property was worth seven hundred thousand dollars so whipped out some money and went and buy started buying in Sydney and we bought two properties at once under one bill of sale like going going nine hundred fifty thousand I took the four hundred twenty five thousand dollar property my husband took the four $90,000 property. And so we did it to two properties beside each other. So we had an uplift of, you know, over $250,000 in nine months. And we're like, hmm, this is kind of wow. cool. Eco That's economics right. of scale. <laughs> Only one Bunnings trip <laughs> for two I properties. Know. I, you know, I always Wait. thought if I was a, um, a superhero, my super weapon of choice would be like Builder's Bog or something. I just bought so much of it. I could do anything with Builder's Bog. <laughs> I think we've just uh, we've we've just encapsulated the whole live session there in, in that five or, or or eight minute sort of spiel. I, don't, I, I think I think we're done. Well, I think we're done here. I think we're done here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I was like, wow, that's you, you're pretty much just covering all the topics. And but uh, but no, that's that, that's a. I, I'm amazed you're going to have to come up with new questions now, Jeff. Oh, I mean, I, 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 got, I got question. I got I got as many questions as I have uh, used to live. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I shouldn't say that it's bad luck, but um, but no, it's interesting because how did you get? So, how did you sort of understand? Because my first property purchase, I I I'll admit I had no idea what I was doing. I, I sort of I thought, okay, how hard can it be? It's just it's got to buy a property, right? So it's interesting yeah. that you had all these kind of metrics and ideas. I, I'm just yeah. I'm blown away by. It. The, the level of analysis and, and due diligence you, you had on that, um, was that sort of mm. from your, your background? How did you kind of come across yeah, that? My idea of relaxing is doing Excel spreadsheets and making macros, you know. So, you know, when, when I got to do some research and when I didn't have the information, like I remember um, I was like a, a girl fan of John Edwards from Residex and he'd put out these amazing prediction reports and things and I was like, if he's got all the information in Australia on all of the suburbs and all of the properties and in a street he can get down to what he thinks these properties are worth, then 
if he could work out what the unrenovated properties were selling for on the renovated, that'd be so good. So, you know, rather than ask for forgiveness and, you know, um, permission, ask for forgiveness. So I made an appointment to go and see him in the offices in North Sydney and Residex. Yes. And I was like, so, John, I'm, an, I'm a property investor. My name's Jane. It'd be really cool if you had a renovation report that would tell us what suburbs had the most disparity in Australia. And he's like, good idea. How would you do that? So I gave him my formula for making up um, the difference of pricing disparity in renovation and out came this extraordinary report. And I remember sitting in his office and this uh, lady came in and said, John, John, we've got a problem. You know, someone's purchased the report for Frankston. And he's like, what's the problem? So there's 350 pages we have to print and send to them. Like they were so old school. It was great. They had this incredible <laughs> data and then they were just printing this stuff to send people reports. They fax, they fax it to them, do they? Or they, 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 they oh. <laughs> People still fax, though. It is still a thing. I'm just amazed. I Whenever know, I see it, it's still a fax. So mm. we, should, we should get into Twitter. Like that, that, that's some great sort of knowledge, and I think we could just have a whole uh, show on that. But should we talk about 2021? Like, does Joe oh. hinted at it? He's keen to talk about it. What do you, what do you Am think, I? Joe? Well, Yeah. Well, I mean, actually, before we go into 2021, I, I'm interested about how things have shifted and changed for you on that um, – that like 10 kilometer radius now because yeah. we're starting to get into that affordability side of yeah. things where 10 kilometers from the city is not really feasible anymore how yeah. is that kind of how is the model because I, I can see a lot of frameworks in what you're talking about that just are solid and they're going to stay stay like that forever but how do you factor in that flexibility now now what are those kind of recommendations and things looking like yeah, and look, it's a really good idea. Actually, it's probably uh, worthwhile I show you. I'm still doing this kind of information all the time. So I'm, yeah. I'm always trying to look at, you know, what's happening in the market. I might just share my screen so you can have a quick yeah, look. Yeah. So love a good share. you do? Great. Can you see that? Not yet, but it'll come up. You, yeah. You, you had a working group. Master of Technology, yeah, right? Up. Amazing. Okay, so, so every single month I get the SQM data research of the last 10 years capital growth for all the states, all the major capital cities and regional areas in Australia. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I think about Melbourne, you know, I was draw drawing this like 10 kilometre map and I was like, what can I afford? And, you know, we're talking about price points now of what, million and 1.3s, you know, 1.7. Yeah. This is not like everyday Australians and, and my mission is to help everyday Australians get financial security so they can get on with life and live to their you know their full um, passions that they want to pursue and spend more time with their kids at the table and 50% of divorces end in financial hardship like full on let's just fix that up so we have more more parents staying at home so you know this is no longer the the area yeah. that people can afford to your point Joe so what I look at is well when they can't afford these areas how do we look at the next area so if we're looking at you know oranges are eight percent nine percent ten percent now this is over 10 years right 10 year capital growth median capital growth so yeah. i'm looking at the next area so i've got these oranges these eights and i've got these you know pinks of nines and oranges and oranges pushing on a green like hmm, 970 is that affordable so you can start seeing this ripple effect <laughs> and so all i'm applying and it's the same methodology i was doing 10 kilometer zone you know areas that i could afford that were close to infrastructure public transport and uh, or acceptable infrastructure for the city because some cities don't it's not public transport it's access ways to freeways and then um, look at you know what was affordable or in that price range and buy the best possible property you can so, you know, so if I, these, these oranges are if, if, if I call one out, there's right near La Trobe University. If you look at there's that blue, there's that uh, dark blue one to the right, okay. to the left and yeah. the right. Which, which suburb is that? That's Kingsbury. Kingsbury. So what's so, the... Yeah, so yeah. this is where it gets into... So this is my high level, like, let's come up with a number of suburbs that have the ability, and I can jump into this a little bit further if you would like, um, have the ability for us to um, really get get in and start having a look at more, what would you say, more detail around it. So I don't want to be looking at hundreds and hundreds of suburbs. I just want to be having a looking at a certain amount. So I want to start with, you know, what can I afford? So if I'm thinking, okay, I'm in Melbourne and I can afford, I don't know, $600,000, for instance, or 650, just happens to be there. Um, and I'm happy to go well below that, 
down to 400 and I want to be between, you know, 20 kilometres of CBD. I want to know what suburbs are in that area. So I've got a list here of suburbs that have um, in my price range. But I also have over here, you know, if I look at some of these and I'm looking at, at these areas here, I've got orange, 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 which is 888, pushing on Deer Park, that's a 7. And now I've got, okay, this is in my price range, you know, let me go and have a look at this suburb and get to know it a little bit better. I want to know the surrounding suburbs. So, you know, are the close the suburbs that are closer to town more expensive? Yes. Is there pricing pressure on them? Yes. What has been... What's the percentage of renters? Remember, 30% was my number. You know, what's the number of sold? Um, you know, what's been the 10-year growth? Has it outperformed what that city has done? So I'm, I was looking at, and now I've created, obviously, the um, suburb selector software to make this easy for people. But, you know, this is what I was doing by my hand. And this is what I was teaching. I was giving people these spreadsheets going, go to the back of the book and get this. Go to a census and get the three-bedroom, you know, the information on the typical house. You know, go to SQM research and get the vacancy rate. Go to census and get the number of renters. So, you know, I was looking at these areas and going, okay, so what does this look like statistically as a area? Because Deer Park would be on my list of pricing pressure here. I'd then go and see if I could afford it, if I can afford it, happy days. And then I'd start doing the extra research. But then there's this human factor. And this is where when we, when we have a chat about that, Jeff, it gets really interesting because this is where the... 2021 we talk about you know the tides rise for everyone and now it's coming out coming back mm -hmm. and there's really interesting um thing observations i have around you know there was the rush to the regions i think there's the retreat from the regions coming on there was the oh my goodness you know perth and perth and darwin have finally you know had their day they're about to come back and then they start That's, retreating and so we're starting to see what the equilibrium is except for one capital city which is completely out and doing something Ooh. very strange Interesting. Okay, so so tell us tell us more because that's interesting. Retreat from the region, uh, retreat from the cities, and and return to the. I mean, I don't, yeah, those, those words you use there. I, I'm uh, I'm I mean I mentioned that because I'm I'm not so sold on this whole return to the office thing because I I mean I, I personally kind of work in an office kind of situation. I'm if, if somebody says I have to go back to an office, I'm going to say well. I don't know, I'm going to go and find, but anyway, okay, maybe I'm the exceptions are all, but I think a lot of no, people... No, I think, I think what you're experiencing is is very real. And where I've been looking at, like, you know, what census tell me most people want, the three-bedroom house. And, you know, yeah. this information is easy to find. You're just going to census and going to um, look up, you know, 2016 numbers. And the problem is we're out, right? We're busting for next year's census data. But... There's a lot of people feeling like you're feeling that they're, they're comfortable at working from home and the you know extra two hours a day not you know being on public transport or in cars this is fantastic or being able to go down to the you know the um, I don't know the nice re family retreat for a long weekend and leaving on the Friday you know all of that's going on there is a little bit of pushback people are on call for like you know 15 hours a day everyone's you know they just assume that you know you're around so you can you're in lockdown so you can start at 7 30 and weekends i'm seeing more and more of my weekends getting meetings in them because people are like well we're yeah. all in lockdown we may as well have a meeting um there's interesting things about some of the uh it companies like the googles and some of the uh, tech companies that have said well it seems you're working from home actually, you know, we're not going to pay you as much as we did and they're pulling their, their incomes back 10 to 20%, even though it's costing yeah, really? you less because they're not paying, paying office. But this, it does bear into, <clears throat> so I'm going to make two points here. The first point is three-bedroom house is what everyone wants. I'm now like three-bedroom plus the one is okay. So let's have a look at the four-bedroom. And I had a so done for you client that I worked with on Friday and we had three properties around that reservoir, Glenroy, Coburg, North area, North area of Melbourne in particular. And it was like he had to get his offer in. And what we were, I was doing these deal reviews of these three areas and, and I, each one of them had the bungalow or the extra retreat that, you know, where you could work from. And, you know, mm. I think that's something that we need to consider. But we look at like the Federation houses and the, the properties of old, all of the reception areas were in the front 
and you know the the doing area and the family areas are out the back and then we had the mums went to work in the 60s and they're only seeing the kids around cooking time when they're rushing in they're like well I kind of want that lifestyle everyone come in and let's talk while we cook but it takes 10 to 15 20 years to change the you know the way that we have our houses set up and now yeah. we've got this new phenomenon where we're like hmm have you had a double vac? You can stay in the front of the house or we hang out at the back. You know, I don't know. But, you know, people are working more from home and uh, and they're more comfortable about it. So I think, you know, adding that plus one bedroom to the typical property is something we'll, we'll get to see more and more of and having, you know, the room where people can work quite comfortably from home and they have the little studios with that, un, you know, iron curtain behind them so that, you know, we look a semi-professional. But we're wearing our sneakers whilst we're wearing our nice clothes and we we um, have that opportunity. And I think this is what, can I go on to my next point now? Do you want to ask anything about that? Well, I feel like you just answer the question. You ask the questions that we've got coming and then you just answer them. So um, well, I, I, I'm happy I, I did, with that. I did want to, um, because you did mention one city is a bit of an outlier. So which, let's, I mean, I kind of want to tease you. Well, let me just finish off this one thing because okay, right, this right. retreat from the regions that you mentioned, <clears throat> So picture this, like we've got the, and I've actually got some really interesting data about the Gen Ys and millennials. Like they're a very conservative bunch and they, to some degree, like being seen by the boss and being, you know, mentored and, and you know, they're the biggest savers of COVID. Like the number two, one and two savers of people who saved money in COVID because they couldn't go and do Kentucky tours, Jane. I couldn't. I wasn't able to go. I mean, I'm over. Exactly and right. And I've done some stuff. I spoke to a group, a crypto group, last night. You know, they made all their money. And they want to put their money in property. And I spoke to a share market group last Tuesday night. Made, made money crypto. and they were bringing their, their money to property. And we were talking about these things. But you know, you looked at the crypto numbers, and most of the short-term traders are over fifty-five. And the younger people are the, I want to stay into the investment for a bit longer. Like it's it's interesting. So we've got this young group of people who kind of like to have that workplace. We've got the 35 to 45. It's kind of like they're on the, the trajectory for their, um, you know, their career path. But they typically have kids that are going into high school or in high school. So they're not going to be moving to, you know, Dubbo High. God bless Dubbo, I'm from Dubbo, but Dubbo High, you know, they want to have their kin kids at Kings, for instance, I don't know. So, you know, I don't think you'll see that age group going, I'm up and off to the Highlands or I'm up and off to Toowoomba or, you know, I don't think yeah, we're going to see that and and I was questioning that. And the other thing is, you know, there is an older generation, I'm going to say, Mothers are older. <laughs> a lot of corporate mothers are older. Um, and so you're the 42-year-old mum turning up the school gates with a kid going to kindy and everyone else is 25, right? And we know that a lot of those relationships and, and relationships as you age go to, to where you hang out the most. And, you know, as parents, we're hanging out with kids, sports, etc. So I think what's happened is there is a bit of, oh, I don't really fit in to the country. I thought the life in the country would be good. There's a lot of resentment from the country people. I remember when I moved to Mudgee as a mining engineer, they said, you're not going to be a local till you've got grand grandparents in the graveyard. I was like, hmm, fair enough. I know we're alive. I could guess I could get them buried here. But, you know, like that was the mentality. But now we've got their kids can't afford, can't work in the city. They're moving back to the towns but can't rent because a lot of people are moving from the city to the country, renting first to check it out. The prices of the properties are going up, so the kids can't even afford the properties. So there's some of that underlying resentment too. So I, I think we will what see. Is all this, what does all this mean? What does all this? Retreat back from the regions. And what are we seeing? The regions are starting to dip. So the regions pushed up, and I'm like, mm, the tide is going out. What's going to happen to the regions? And we're starting yeah, to call, see them. Call logic doesn't say. Call logic data doesn't say that though, Jane. Like if I, oh. like, and I, I get reminded of it every month by Braden. He tells me, oh, the regions are going fantastic. I'm like, well, yeah, I, I can't argue that they they have significantly is, outperformed the capital. They're system. definitely they're definitely coming back though. You see, you can start seeing that they're coming back. And so we, we're going to, like what Perth and Darwin has experienced in the last two months, just watch the speed of the growth. But what about what about when if you're coming back, you're not going to be able to afford to come back? Like what are you coming back to? 
So home. I know. So and that's what's going to happen with rentals, right? They're going to have to come back and they're going to have to find somewhere to live. And we've already got renting rental pressure. You know, yeah. who knows if they're going to open the borders? We had what 2019, we had 180,000 people migrate to Australia. They're talking about doubling that in the next yeah. few years. So we're going to have that rental there. pressure. And they're, they're going to work for a year. How long, Jeff? You're a broker. year or two and go, all of a sudden I can now get a loan. I'm going to be buying a house. Yeah. It's going to be, yeah. I, and then we'll, we'll get into what 2022 and beyond potentially looks like. But um, 2021, it's, I mean, you've seen a couple of the markets, you've seen Perth and Darwin. And, and, and there are parts of Perth, I've seen some posts out there, people are still sort of selecting areas. But I, I was... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable necessarily about Perth, but um, at, it hasn't, at the moment, it hasn't got shot up. It hasn't done anything yet. And you need to have. You don't want to be first in right at the beginning, right at the the top mm. of the clock. You want to kind of wait until you start to see some shoots coming along. I, 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 just don't, like, I don't. I don't even understand the market, though, Joe. Like I'm, I'm an and, east. And I think the Jeff, the reason that I can't understand the market is the market's just linked to commodities. And we look at the iron ore price. We look at it coming up. We look at what's happening with um, China. The, that kind of uh, trade wars, you know, it's, iron ore is pretty much the last thing that they need that they haven't, you know, given us a bit of a whack over the hand with. And, you know, that is the the mining market of Perth. That's what drives Perth. And if, and if, that, mm. if that falls and who knows, like, yeah, we could see. So what, what, what is that one city? Before we kind of move on to the crux of the, the, not the, crux, the renovation, because I think we really want to um, – Give I mean, promised actionable and all that sort of stuff. But what's the one city that you? I think I know what it is. But, but can you, could you let us in on the secret chain, please? Um, okay. So as I said, I'm watching this the the tide go out, and I'm watching because yeah. I'm as a student of long term data. I I try to find um, the information and look at. Uh, where I think the market is going. And so there's the numbers and then there's the human factor. And it's funny, I saw your interview with Peter Kalisas last week and he'd come and talk to my mentoring group and we we were getting into the data and his, his spreadsheets of his analysis of what cities um, had taken the leading growth over the last 30 years. And we we're kind of breaking down and doing some analysis over that. And, you know, spoiler alert, at, at any one time, pretty much any city in, in Australia has been the number one city, right, um, a capital city. And so well, I was looking at this, but, you know, there's Sydney and Melbourne and they are the powerhouse economy cities. Sid Melbourne pre-COVID was due to be the biggest capital city population-wise in Australia by 2030, 32, 33, 35, whatever that looks like now. And then when people move to Australia, they go to where the jobs are, which is Sydney and Melbourne. And, you know, I've got um, three people from Columbia who work for me and they all Googled the most livable, safest city in Australia and Melbourne came up and they moved here. Now, if I'm sitting outside of Australia and, you know, and looking at you know, where is, and we've kind of, as much as it's been a bit of a pain in the ass, let's face it, we've kind of handled COVID better than, than a lot of countries, but we've got this safety and security of an island. And when you look at where people are looking at, and especially people in America, they're looking at, you know, where to buy properties, they're looking at Australia. <clears throat> now, we have obviously missed a couple of the cycles, a couple of countries have opened up and had overseas students come in already we've missed that cycle but it looked like we were you know june next year about to open up the borders again so i looked at this and i was like well where are people going to go they usually land in sydney and melbourne you know um <clears throat> louis christopher came and talked to my mentoring group on sunday and we're really trying to drill him on you know affordability and the boom and bust report and you know what was his thoughts of the future and um he was saying that he's been in working with the government and presenting to the government on affordability. And there's been a bit of a coherence in voice through a number of the property, you know, experts or data-driven scientists and, and market researchers saying that they really need to put infrastructure into the regions. And they believe that that's where, you know, to make things affordable, that's where they need to be putting the money so that they can, you know, really um, get people from the major cities into the regions. So, you know, to make things I've, affordable that, for the city. Yeah. Right. And so I'm watching this like, yeah, Sydney, Melbourne, this is where the the major 
people come. I'm watching all of the tech growth in Adelaide and looking at a lot of these um, companies that are setting up these amazing little tech hubs there quietly. Um, you know, there's all these kind of things happening. And then we've got Brisbane. And oh, Brisbane, yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. Let's, let's kind of, let's get the punchline is Brisbane. I was, I was, Brisbane. I was, I was, I Brisbane is my Brisbane. outlier. I cannot predict Brisbane. I can't, I can never predict Canberra because, you know, Labor gets in and hires everyone and everyone comes and moves to Canberra and then Liberal gets in and they sack everyone and get all the, the fancy expensive. Well, the, the thing about Canberra is there's just the, the wage, the, this, I mean, having known a few people in Canberra, I didn't understand it, but, but Canberra, the salaries there are so high. So people can afford to keep buying and, and they, they, they're comfortable paying that sort of million dollars plus very easily, even though it's a smaller. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's weird. Like my sister was chief of staff to one of the senators there. And um, you go to a party and they go, uh, you know, what level are you? Like, that's the conversation because everyone works in government. Yeah, if you're yeah, level yeah. 35, we know that you're on 150. If you're a level 36, you're 175. Like, by defining your level, you know exactly who you're about to date, what they earn, right? <laughs> Interesting. But um, so Canberra, I can never predict Canberra, and I wish I could. But then there's, and then there's Hobart, and Hobart's had its time in the sun. All the investors got there, 2019, Airbnb, you know, there's a lot of environmental retreating people there, and there's a lot of the people who are moving there are older retirees. It's kind of a weird dynamic happening in Hobart. But Brisbane is weird because I think if I, what we will see in 2022 is we're going to see people Googling, you know, best place to live in Australia, and Brisbane's going to come up, and that's how their government has handled COVID. So, Anecdotally, I had three clients in the last month who told me, and this is not a statistically relevant, you know, section of community, but I've tested this with Peter Wargent and Peter Kalisas and Louis and, and a couple of others. And one um, family are in Byron. They have a son that needs to have an operation that in Brisbane. If the borders are closed, they can't get there. So mum and son have moved to Brisbane. Dad and the kids are back in Byron. Another mother, when they're about to, to um, close down, lock down Sydney, has a child on spectrum who needs to be socialised at school. She and the kids stayed in Brisbane while dad and the high school kids stayed in Sydney. Another client down here in Melbourne, every time their darling little girl has to go into ICU about once a month, they have to go into lockdown when they go home and the high school kids can't go to school. So mum and daughter have moved to Brisbane, dad and kids stay here. So I think, you know, it's splitting families up until the rest of the family can catch up. But not only is it affordable, it actually has been open pretty much all of the time. And people up there, you speak to people in Brisbane and they're like, what do you mean you can't go to the pub or you can't have a party? And what do you, you know, it's, they've had a few kind of shutdowns. And I think, you know, Brisbane is going to be, no longer the bridesmaid and 2.3% capital growth over the last 10 years. Like, you know, I told my sister to buy in Brisbane four years ago and she's still like, when's this going to happen? I'm like, mm. it should, it should. <clears throat> well, it is. I'm, and it I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not moving to Brisbane, Jane. I'm just going to put it not out. It's, it's not, it's not going to happen. I, I don't know. Nice to visit. I'm not in Brisbane. Like, Jesus. Mm. Uh, yeah. Mind you, it's nice. It's like when you go to Perth. It's and England. I remember getting in a, in a taxi in Perth and this guy said, ooh, you know, there's going to be some traffic. And I was like, oh, really? He said, oh, you're from back east, are you? And I was like, yeah. And I said, what, what's traffic? He said, it's five to five. There's going to be traffic jam as always this time of day. It's going to be oh, five to seven minutes. And I was like, oh, that's okay. I think I'll stay in the taxi. Like, you know, it's a whole different <laughs> world. It's like a big country yeah. town. Everyone's friendly. Interesting. Yeah, that was, that right. was what uh, Peter Kleesos said about Adelaide. He's like, welcome to Adelaide. Big old country town. <laughs> yeah, come over for dinner. <laughs> yeah, but but that COVID situation, the way that they've handled mm. COVID, is is a temporary. I mean, we're buying for the next twenty years. We're not buying for the next twenty months. Um, or are we? I don't. Well, I hope not. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, we're, we're starting to look at Europe, and we're looking at how they're treating this new um, strain, and they're starting to lock down again. And as soon as we start talking about you're going to have another Christmas without your family or having that indecision of the, whether you can get to them or not and, you know, what does life look like after this? I think, you know, that that kind of retreat to southeast Queensland is something that could be sustained. Mm. I'm not moving. You're not moving. Jeff's not moving. But there are people thinking about it. 
I would like to. I, 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 I personally, I personally don't know anybody, and I, I know a lot of people. I don't know anybody that's moved to Queensland. So I, I, I mean, thank you. Yeah, I, don't I know, mean, it's funny because yeah. I was watch. I was waiting for these. Um, what do you call them? Like doomsdayers. I was waiting for the doomsdayers to go. Okay, this is the zombie apocalypse. We're going to get our piece of land, and we're going to, you know, sewage tanks on all this kind of stuff. I only had one client like that in the last two years. Is like, okay, we're going self sufficient. We're going to like shut down. We've got a river, and uh, because I was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to come out of the woodwork. Maybe I'm not the kind of person that they'd ring, but you know, I only had one of those. But yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, People are, I've got mentoring students that have been supporting buying in Brisbane and it's got to the stage where the agent will say, we're going to auction, we'll have our first open home on Saturday, 24 contracts are out on Saturday afternoon, we're negotiating on Sunday to put in the best and final offer and I'm doing comparable prices so they can come up with a negotiation plan. I'm like, I can't, I cannot support a price over 620 but you're going to have to go 650 to get this. And they're going 650. There's a 670 offer, but they get to the 650 because they've got no finance included. And it's That's a risk. Bad. And I've yeah, never, yeah. ever recommended anyone to do that in my life unless I know they've got another 50 in the bank that they can come to the party. The vow doesn't stack up. But that's how they're securing properties up there. And come Monday, the border's open and a happy, happy days, you know. Everyone's going to be rushing up there. And it is the short term. That, that, that also means people can come back, though. So, I mean, I'm just going to I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, I think people are maybe paying a little too much, and and maybe it's I don't know, not all liquid is his goal. But let's let mm. let Tom will. So is it the flight? Is it the flight to affordability? Is that what we're looking? Yeah, at it's now? an affordable. I mean, you sell your two million dollar home in Q, pay off the mortgage, buy a one million dollar mansion in Brisbane. And happy days, you know. And I think also, I mean, I had dinner with um, Rob flux from the property developers network and you know he's based in brisbane he's down in melbourne at the moment and he can't get back unless you know he goes into quarantine for 14 days at home blah 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 you know people are sick of that and they're like we don't have any of this kind of stuff in brisbane you know mm. so and i think that you know i've always talked about investing for the long term and when i look at my over the last 15 years of you know coaching and teaching and you know working with people in the mortgage business or the education business it always comes down to those with a, a clear vision and a long-term vision of what they want to connect with and do and having the mindset of understanding what their current reality is and getting that bridge and understanding you know how they can um, buy now in proven areas and, you know, to me, Sydney and Melbourne have always been the proven areas and the satellite cities, the Geelongs, Wollongongs and Newcastles. Work from home has allowed us to actually work from those areas, you know, two or three days a week and commute, which is great. But Brisbane is somewhere that I've, you know, I really haven't with my whole heart really wanted to say I think there's some real legs in this that are going to be long term. And once the borders are open, I think we'll see more. And I don't believe the Olympics are the bump, the cream, because we know, you know, the studies that I've done in um, looking at Melbourne and Sydney post-Olympics, Gold Coast post-G20 Expo, Brisbane post-Expo, there was all infrastructure builds that created that property market kind of boom in those areas. And after those events, everything kind of died. And if you think about Brisbane getting the Olympics, they were actually the last man standing and it was because they had most of the infrastructure in place or planned that was brought Nobody forward. No one, no one was moving there to build, right? So I don't think that I, I never, after my I did that analysis, I wasn't too convinced that that's what uh, the option, there was an opportunity based on the Olympics, but there's going to be a run-up definitely of interest and there'll be expenditure put into hotels and retail. Mm. So... I'm interested about like renovation because yeah. that's Absolutely. a strategy that doesn't rely on a heavy market uplift um, to keep it alive, right? You can make money in and obviously you want to be buying in good capital growth locations, but you can make your money now as well as in the future. So um, how does... How does renovation kind of tie into the the kind of purchases that you're seeing clients making making today? Is 2021 
because I don't feel like 2021 was the year of the renovation, but I feel like 2022 might be the year of re- 2022 and 23. I think you're going to be. I know a lot of people renovation. doing renovation shows, so I think I think 2021 was definitely one. Uh, people were doing a lot of renovation. I've seen it on on their home, Jeff. Uh, yeah, yeah, or well, on their home, or maybe not their resting property. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. suppose I'm just talking any dog. I don't know. I don't go around people's doors knocking on and saying, oh, "Are you? Are you? Is this a, Is this your? Is this your investment property, or is this a home you're living in?" I don't do that, but I, I've seen. I've seen it around the, and even sort of, yeah, a lot of people have done that. But so, anyway, I don't know. What are your thoughts, um, Jane? Um, I have. Let me think. Like for instance. I had a chat to a client recently. I love renovation. Renovation is, you know, my strategy. It's how you make, you know, you spend a dollar, you make $2. Every day of the week, if you put a dollar into an ATM and $2 popped out, like happy days, right? Rich man very soon. And so, I, and I love renovation for so many reasons. One is untapping that equity that allows you to go again if you have the servicing to do that, pushing the rents up or sustaining a really good renter for a long period of time and reducing vacancies and i don't know about you guys but you know i've got seven investment properties and during covid you know half of them kind of tapped me for a rent reduction in some way you know and so you know that that's kind of a bit painful but if you've got a really good rent uh renter and you've already you know above the market really with your rents because you've got a superior product there was capacity for for me to come down um but renovation is is interesting because at the moment you know we had the bushfires we had the reduction in timbers we've got the the distribution channel problems which has pushed up the you know um, additional prices for the the components that we need for kitchens and bathrooms and and, you know just some of the fundamentals for the builders we've seen building companies go broke you know they've had you know some significant issues and, and people lose their their dough on it and their deposits and that's because this cost has gone up and you know, we've ha- I've had some works that had to be done on a on a unit in Sydney, and you know we just couldn't get people there because there was a lot of the people that were in the hot spots, and so a lot of the trades. Mm. So you know, it really um, it, it wasn't a strategy that was able to be with confidence put in place and knowing that you could do a renovation on time and on budget because as yeah, soon the as unknown, one, there was, there was... out. Like logistically speaking, like renovations can be very easy to organize, but it can definitely get very difficult very quickly and throw in those logistical issues. It's just doesn't, it doesn't become worth it mentally. Like, and this is the thing, right? Most people think that renovation is an active strategy for now, but it can be almost like land banking. You know, you've got a, a tenant in place, don't kick them out to renovate. And that's even mm. more so now. It's like, well, buying a property with that pricing disparity between unrenovated and renovated properties that allow you to make a profit, cover your costs and cover your um, holding costs, you know, happy days, do that and bank it. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I was talking to i've talked to a few people in the last few days around well how can you do renovation with a kick right so you know buying a good growth area buying an area that's going up in value with a capital growth back end but what could be a kick a kick could be an area a property that has potential to have a development maybe a one into two Mm -hmm. and essentially you know when i talk about the trident strategy which is taking the property to a higher and better use i use renovation some people use development some subdivision granny flats whatever everyone co-living people have different ways of doing what they think that is but you know if you bought a property with renovation potential for the near term and the growth opportunity in three to five years it could actually have enough equity to actually make it a development site that allows you to do you know a, a jv with the developer or do it yourself you know or you know, for those that are looking for, you know, the potential uplift of cash flow now, you know, you could do the renovation that could, you know, improve your cash flow. You could do like the micro apartment type living um, opportunities. We've got a lot of old people who have a lot of spare rooms who do not want to go into nursing homes, who want to age in place, you know, by doing a, I don't know, 20, 30, $40,000 reno and creating half the house into a, a separate unit so that they can get a revenue. You know, there's, I think there's some really great innovations and I think, you know, what we'll see in the coming years is that these 
conservative, I'm going to say, millennial Gen Ys who are saving the money pretty shitty that they can't afford a house because of affordability, don't really trust crypto. All they can do is put their money in shares. Super is like forever away. And, you know, they're looking at ways, and I think we'll see some amazing, you know, disruptive type of fractional investing opportunities. And, you know, I'm, I'm an advisor on a number of prop techs and, you know, they just excite me. I'm seeing I'm proppy, P-R-O-P-P-I-E. I'm seeing some really innovative buying solutions on Realify. I'm seeing ways of disrupting how people buy. So I'm seeing some of these come through. And I think that um, there's going to be great opportunities. But renovation is definitely a strategy. It's just not the do we rush in and do it now strategy. It's like get the property with the same renovation criteria that you would do and then bank it. Or, you know, look at the property you have at the moment and go, well, how can I take that to even better, higher use? Mm, okay. I like it. I'm all about, I'm, I, I love a good reno and I love a, a reno with a, an extra add-on kick as well, like where you can do the development later on. Do um, One of the things that you were talking about before was the disparity between renovated and unrenovated. So mm. can you talk to that? Like why is, why is that disparity important? Um, okay, I I have a slide on this too. Do you want me to share? Yeah, okay, yeah, well actually, yeah, let's let's do that. Well, let's um let's jump wanna... into our um second sponsor and then we'll we'll get uh the beautiful we'll start Steve Felicia. Because I I have some questions about the renovation for the finance sector as well. And I know you use you, you're a renovation queen plus a, a broker, a broker, uh, I don't know, master of, um as well. Extraordinaire, so, I think is what you're saying. Magician, yeah. I think we, we yeah, nailed. Magician, says the word. But yeah. <laughs> He said a lot of things in those promos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get let's do this and uh, can... exactly. Commercial property offers the highest cash flow in Australian property investing, offering exceptionally higher yields than residential. Now we're talking eight to ten percent net yields. That's cash after all expenses, not this two to six percent gross that we see in the residential space. So for those that are starting out on their commercial investing journey, it can be exciting, but it's also a step not to be taken lightly. The expertise of a commercial buyer's agent can pay dividends to help you secure that high cash flow and high growth potential property. And this is why we recommend Steve Polisi of Polisi Property. With over six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He has seen it all and knows the best locations right for growth. In a previous life, Steve was a chartered mechanical and structural engineer, so he draws on his mathematical and analytical skills that he's developed to break down what works best in commercial property. As with engineering, same goes with commercial property. It's based primarily on the numbers. So if you're curious about diversifying into commercial property, you have access to $100,000 in cash or in equity, book a call with Steve today and find that perfect asset for you. Thanks very much, Joe. That was, uh, there we go. We are back. Is Joe back? Oh, that's, that's, that's the question. Oh, he's... <laughs> so, so we, we were, we're going to share a slide and talk of, and here we go. That was, uh... Oh, wow. Okay. So um, one of the things that people often ask me is why renovations fail. So the very first reason is there's no strategy. They're, they're like, okay, I'm going to flip the property. They go and buy a property. They can't sell it. And they're like, well, I'll rent it out. Now, the reality is if you're flipping a property, you're targeting the streets where the owner occupiers are. And when you're renting, you're targeting the, a complete different renovation and the different area, even in the suburb. So strategy is really important to understand before you buy the property. There's no suburb selection. They're understanding pricing pressure, understanding the fundamentals that drive the suburbs. But then they're buying the wrong property. And this is like what, what we were just talking about was that, you know, yeah. often a lot of suburbs are not created equal. And if renovation is a strategy, the problem is that you can't make money in every suburb. And that's where I see people making um, a lot of mistakes around uh, buying the wrong property and not understanding it. Now, this is just once a month, I run my algorithm with SQM research data. And, you know, I current median price in Australia is around 850 or something or other. And I was just trying to work out, you know, is there um, suburbs in Australia in every state that are popping up that, you know, have got all of the pricing pressure, the renting co concentration, the vacancy rates, you know, there are suburbs of the 
eight and a half thousand suburbs that I assess every month, there's about 300 that get on my list, my, my um, starting list. The rest do not make any sense to buy in. And then you go in and do that next understanding of, well, are there, is there enough pricing disparity in the street? So, you know, what I'm looking at is how much is a renovated property and how much is an unrenovated property selling for? And it's the difference between those two that allow me to understand what the pricing disparity is. So that disparity is just a fancy word for saying the difference between the renovated and the unrenovated. And a lot of properties that kind of look like they need a renovation, you know, can't actually make the money. So we're talking about profitability here. We're not talking about, you know, just because it looks unrenovated means that you can become a renovator and make some money out of it. And then the next thing that happens is people then overcapitalize and they renovate to their own taste. You know, they have the champagne kind of um, taste of the Caesar Stone waterfall bench tops where in actual fact, you know, a laminate, really nice laminate will do. And, and I think, you know, when you understand that you're buying in a suburb at $400,000 and it's going to cost you a, for a, you know, a cosmetic renovation, $40,000, and you want to make $2 every $1, so we're, you know, we're at four eighty, dollars and it costs you in stamp duty twenty. dollars We're talking about finding unrenovated properties at four hundred dollars and then renovated properties at five hundred. dollars That's that pricing disparity that you need to make money after you've got holding costs and all those other things in there as well. And I think that's the missing piece that a lot of people just don't get. You know, yeah. So, sure so how do you do how do you do that on mass? Like how do you find the disparity between yeah. like yeah, how do you get that Unfortunately, at a, at a rate? Yeah, it's a great question. Unfortunately, it is a real manual process. So the way that that I do this is that I, um, well, I get my students to do it. Is you know we'll get RP data, for instance, and we'll say um, houses, three to four bedroom houses in Mount Gravatt that have been sold in the last six months, and then we download that to an Excel spreadsheet. And then yeah. I go into SQM research. I'm like, well, what's the typical size block? It's 600 to 800 square meters. So I just do a sort. And so you might end up with 25 properties. And then unfortunately, it is a manual exercise that goes, is this property high set, low set on the right side of the road, wrong side of the road, renovated, unrenovated, or is it a partial renovation? Um, so, or is it just upgraded in the eighties? And so you've got, you know, the area in the suburb, you've got, you know, high set, low set, whatever that's defined for your area. It might be swimming pools and, you know, the thing that that uh, defines that type of property. And then you have renovated, unrenovated or updated. And so then very quickly I can go through and go, okay, so how much per square metre are all the three-bedroom renovated high set properties um, selling for? So, for instance, one of my mentoring students, I had her do this for Wynnum West. And so we knew specifically what the high set and the low set, the renovated and unrenovated prices and points were in that suburb. We knew there was no pricing disparity between the unrenovated and renovated low set, but there was in the high set. So that's the criteria she gave her buyer's agent. In this suburb, I would like to find an unrenovated at this price point, high set property. In the uh, one of the other three suburbs that she had and gave to the buyer's agent, she she said you can have um, high set or low set, but this is the price point for each of them. So very specific to the buyer's agent. So unfortunately, it's a little manual to get that information, but geez, the power of being specific and getting the property you want is amazing. Have you thought of ways? Like, what's the what's how have you like what have you tried to come up with? How do, you, how, do you do it, how do you do it automatically? Joe, Joe wants it quicker. He doesn't want to do the work. He wants to resolve. I understand. Well, see, here's the thing, right? I get this. So you know my dot map? I have people doing that with dots, right? I run work <laughs> workshops. I've got people around Australia that hate my guts because they've been dotting these dot map, you know, glass of wine <laughs> turns into a bottle. It's night nights. Some people have been doing it for years. And, um, and you know, I, th- I was I had actually um, had brain surgery two years ago and I'm laying in hospital after brain surgery and I'm like, what if my brain doesn't work? How are people going to, how can I teach this? And I thought, oh, I bet you I could digitise it. So I, whilst laying in hospital, found some, I think it was in Ukraine, Ukraine designer on Fiverr and had him design the dot maps for me. And then I was like, 
what you know i've got people to do all this research on you know the vacancy rates and da, 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 da. what if i could do that really quickly because i've got the suburb selector software where they can go through and do it and so now i can do that in seven seconds so i like the way you're thinking joe because i'm like how can i find if it's renovated and unrenovated now there's getting to be some really clever ai in identifying renovation pictures like yeah. is this a stool or is it a table or, or you know whatever yeah. Um, so I think we're going to get some picture type information there. Um, you know, the renovation report that Residex used to put out that uh, RP Data stopped after they bought Residex really gave us an idea of where that price uh, sat in relation to the entire street. So if there's 100 properties in the street, then they cut them up into 10 percentiles. And you could see if there was a number four, like the bottom 40 30 to 40 percent was at 400,000 and the 60 to 70 percent was at 550,000 there's some disparity in there that deserves you to go in and have a little bit further look at it so there is some hacks so for instance I might go and get the suburb report from RP data for a suburb and it says the 25 percentiles here the 50s here and the 75s here now if I can take the 50 and take 10 percent so 50 is 500,000 and I can take um, a 10% cosmetic reno and say 50 is the amount of the reno, 50 is the amount of the profit. If the 75% is less than 600, it tells me that I can't make a profit in that area generically without going through every single sale. So I'm always trying to you know, give my students hacks where they can get down from those maybe 300 suburbs in Australia down to the 10 that will really work with the pricing disparity. So I think it's coming. Yeah, yeah, that, that's where my thought was going as well. There's a lot of AI tech around that um, yeah. that definitely can be that can be taken advantage of, especially the way domains giving out their API and you get all the you can download all the images and just just store them, run the anyway. Anyway, that's going that's going deep. But one 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 other question I have about um, the tech side of things is that on your dot maps, you created mm -hmm. a dot map, right? Just the thing. Have you seen any other metrics that align nicely with the uh, you know the thesis um, outside of vacancy rates? Like, have you done any dot maps from not just vacancy rates for? No, for my, my dot maps are on the ten year capital growth. Well, there you go. So it's so, based on so growth any, and price and pressure. Are there any other sort of kind of metrics aside? From are there any other ones that you've, that you've done? Um, it's interesting mm -hmm. because, you know, um, what, what was Peter saying last week? We, uh, professional women move to an area and then all of a sudden the property prices yeah. go up. I, I, I have that, yeah. that as, soon as, as soon as an area starts voting green, you start seeing the prices go up. It's like the hits. Oh, that was your comment. <laughs> And then there's like, you know, it's the organic shops pop up and the gentrification. That's a little bit too late for me. I want to see things before. So what fascinates me, um, at one stage I was in conversations with a group um, that had IBM Watson and I was like, these are the things that I want you to go into this big computer to tell me exactly what the lead indicators are that we don't know. Is it? So it could be something stupid like, um, uh, golly, the amount of, dog food starts going up in the local woolies you know people can afford a pet and um they they're more likely to be in a house and therefore <laughs> you know they're more likely to have a higher expenditure i don't know what it is i want to know what it is is it that there they start go. um booking so every, holidays interstate people pet from barn. One suburb. you know this, every time this a pet barn thing. opens <laughs> I know. And so I was listing down and I had like a hundred random things that I wanted Watson to run to go, hmm, what do you think? Because I think there is, you know, there is um, things that start happening where the areas start gentrifying that it might just be people have Stan and they have, you know, Apple, you know, because they can afford two streaming things. So I don't know what it is. But um, it fascinates me in, in seeing where the data can lead us. I, I must admit, as somebody who, uh, when I first started, I would not have ever considered anything like this. And I think I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I've got to say, I think if, yeah, I think the analysis by paralysis, start thinking how many streaming services people have got, got in the area. Um, but yeah, I, but I, I'm, I'm just through. thinking, how can we do it quicker, right? I'm, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go yeah, to the answer. 
quicker is not always better, I would say. I'm kind of a what, what, what minimum effective dose, I would say, um, and, and kind of let's, yeah. So well, that's, I, what, actually, I that's, know, that's what I like about Jane, your, um, your analysis is over 10 years. Like you're looking at your dot mat over 10 years. It's 20, not like yeah. you can get so, as exactly like what Jeff mm. is saying, like um, you can look at like at the trend over the past six months and you're like, holy, this thing is going down. Everything's going down, but, um, you know, vacancy rates are going down, um, you know, supplies going down, inventory is going down. Like this is the best place to buy. And then you buy there, but then it hasn't got the solid fundamentals of, of any capital growth. And you're just like, mm, damn it, yeah. big mistake. And, and funny, I had um, a crypto expert come and talk to my mentoring group on Sunday and he has been in my mentoring group and we talked about de-risking kind of investing in crypto and the potential for property exchange and fractional Don't investing. Blah, blah. <laughs> and um, but, So here's the funny thing. He, he applied all of my investing criteria to buy, buy the best possible asset that you can. None of these random alternate kind of, you know, NDISs and buy in the US and all these other things that were NRAS or whatever. Buy the best pro product, Bitcoin, you know, um, do the research on what the, the estimate growth has been in the past and predict it to the future. Now, it, it drives me crazy, right? Because like, what do they have, a 20% drip? drop and then the next day it went up and I'm just like this is not my risk profile I am not a crypto investor I bought crypto for the first time two weeks ago because I'm using it to mint nfts for my husband's art so I'm learning how to do it so that I can start um, putting his art up so people get prints physical prints because I still can't imagine why you just want an electronic thing so I'm learning it so I had to buy crypto so I could actually pay to put his stuff up and I, you know you put in a thousand dollars and they're like tomorrow it's worth 750 I'm like this is why I don't do shares you know I much I much um it's like when you become a millionaire as a property investor you only find out afterwards because you're like there no bell rang like but that happened like six months ago oh i missed it you know that was my goal and then i missed it with with uh, shares you're like i'm a millionaire no i'm not i'm a million no i'm not and you know so but it was interesting to hear how he had used the methodology of um of the the research by the best possible prop well asset that you could at the time and invest based on that research so yeah it's interesting times yeah so mm. i, I want to so let's just say somebody's a, a renovation because I, I think i, I, I want to hear about how to actually do renovation um compared to or do renovation from a broker's perspective as well because you you can't have a foot in both cans so let's just say i've done a renovation i've really i've mailed two to one i've, I've gotten that out I, i've got a couple of kind of practical questions so num number one how, how do you sort of because banks the valuations will vary so how do you uh, advise or help your clients make sure they're getting the best possible valuation on that property? Yeah, look, it's um, the if it's a very quick buy and renovate, what often happens, and you know, fast moving market, this can be a little different. But what has happened over the last fifteen years, sixteen years, I've been a mortgage broker, is that most banks will default to the valuation that they've held for the last six months so if you've actually gone oh, i bought for seven hundred thousand dollars and i think it's now worth 900 and you go to the bank and they do a desktop they're like it's 720 and you're like no you missed the renovation so you need to have a walkthrough um i've always and in, in my ultimate guide to renovation course i've actually got a whole module on how to i'm going to call it influence the valuer and so you know help, help, help them see the value yeah yeah, I'm not saying manipulate. I'm just saying influence them in, in a positive way and actually demonstrating the work that you've done and mm. the uplift and the comparable prices. Now, valuers have, I mean, these guys go to uni, right? They, it's not like you turn up one day and you're a valuer. They have credentials. Yeah, they have really to prove possible. the valuation to their bosses, you know. Um, Insurance, so, yeah. All of, yeah, all of that. So, you know, they've done most of 90% of the work before they turn up to the property. So they are expecting what the picture is on, on the website. They're expecting um, to, they've done a comparable sale and by looking at what the pictures look on the website and what you bought it for. Now, if they turn up and 
you spent $40,000 and you bought it for 700 and they say, how much did you spend? And you go, $40,000. Well, guess what? Your property <laughs> is going to be worth $740,000. So when I say influence, it's about saying, you know, when I was doing the research and these were seven, buying for uh, selling for 700 and I purchased this below market at the time because blah, blah, blah. As you can see at the time I bought it, these were the other pro properties that were were buying and now the renovated properties are selling for 900 and they have this this is three of the properties that have recently sold um i have a superior living space but an inferior um you know carport or whatever so you kind of use the language that they use in the in the valuation document as well and then yeah. put, put it forward don't say i've spent forty thousand dollars you know this is equivalent to the value of this nine hundred thousand okay. dollar property yeah, and, and, you know, and then you've kind of done half the work for them, you know, and it's just like dating, you, you know, everything happens in the the first 30 seconds. You walk into the bar and you're going, hmm, this looks all right. Street appeal. Like, you know, the people, I think it was, a, was it Joe? No, it was you, Jeff, your quote at the top of the, the talk today. And, you know, it's around you've done all this work, you've done all this research, you've found the property, you've slaved away, you've given up your weekends, your friends don't know yeah, your name, your dog doesn't come to you anymore, and you're like, you've got this letterbox that's falling over at the front of the house. You're like, dude, why did you give up? Why did you and, yeah, and yeah. you don't influence the valuer, you know. So, yeah, walk through when you can. When, make sure you're there and give them your document. Say, here's the information and here's the sales. And, you know, make try to make sure that you can have that conversation and demonstrate the value that you've added to the area and do not give up on, you know, a run out of um, budget so therefore I didn't landscape the front or put in a couple of, you know, trees or whatever it is you know, do the best yeah. and paint the door and make sure yeah. the doorbell works and when the value walks in make it a wow and you know the ways that i've done that i've i uh, when i did my first property walking into a big old house that's been renovated nicely floorboards look good blah blah um it's great but walking into an environment where you can sit down and go, hmm, this looks kind of nice and this is set up nice. So I went and got it costed to get it staged. And I think it was like $3,000 to stage the house so I could set the scene. Gave me beautiful photos for when I was trying to rent the property for the last, you know, for 15, 20 years afterwards. But also, it, um, you know, you can't tell me that a value is not influenced between the, the empty, noisy houses you walk through to the house that you've set the environment up for. Yeah, someone in this group did exactly Definitely that. Is. They're like, yeah, I'm getting the value we're in. I'm going to spend $2,500, $3,000 on it because I know. And then they, and then you see the next post, it's like, guess what? <laughs> they loved well, it. I've, I've had students that have gone around their friend's house the weekend before and collected the nicest pieces of furniture of all their friends and, you know, decked out the house. So, you know, <laughs> you don't have yeah. to pay the money. We can always be, I'm always looking at, at ways to uh, save money. And that's why, um, for instance, the with the Ultimate Guide to Renovation, I give people the, the trade discount card with RenoSave because I'm like, hell yeah. During lockdown, we had a Power Pass card that got us into Bunnings when no one else was, everyone else was doing click and collect. And, you know, I think um, National Tiles, it is the best discount of the builders building 500 houses cannot even get the discount that we get with that. So, you know, I'm also also about renovating strategically on budget or if I can get the the products that I want, the quality products that I want a little bit cheaper, even better, more profit for me. What about selling and flipping, uh, flipping, flipping property? How does mm -hmm. that kind of fit in um, with your, with your strategy or do a lot of your clients do this? Because this is like the go-to, right? Everyone thinks I need to buy, renovate, sell, buy, renovate, sell. And then eventually yeah. I'll get to that, that point. But how does that kind of sit this, this day and age now? In a growing market, flipping can hide a lot of sins. And, you know, I remember I had one of my mortgage clients who were, they had done, they had flipped their homes three times and they're like, we're going to give up our job and we're going to start flipping property. So we are so good at this. And I went back and looked at what the property price was that they bought at and the growth in that area in that subsequent three years, they made nothing off the renovation and they're about to give up their jobs and this is going to, they're putting life savings into it. Um, a lot of people who sign up for that ultimate guide to renovation course come in thinking they want to flip 
And then they leave thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, I, I'm glad I didn't do it. And, you know, I think I've got a whole section in there on flipping because you know the numbers, it can work, but you have to be in and out very quickly. You have to know the numbers. You have to be on budget. You have to be on time. Most people who flip, the biggest problem is they don't have deal flow. They need to move from one property to the next property quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they don't take into account capital gains tax or they buy in a, in a company and, you know, they have, you know, subsequent yes, yes, problems. Yes, yes. So there's, there's a lot of issues that you watch the block and it seems easy. Whereas, you know, Todd and I... They don't, they, they don't make money on the block, though. That's the thing. I mean, no, well, no. I mean some of them might. Yeah, oh, yeah. You have to sell it three million bucks. Or the very first property that they had on the block in, in Bondi, like, I think it was like 2002, we looked at buying that block of units and there was about $2 million of works that had to be done before they could start the works that the channel TV channel paid for before they let the people in there. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's smoke mirrors. I watched the block maybe once every four or five years on the auction show, just for a bit of entertainment. That's it. That's fun. <laughs> so not yeah. recommended to, uh, Buy Reno flip. Buy Reno flip. Yeah. Um, well, we're not, we're not, we're not recommending or not recommending anything, Joe. It's not funny. No, I, I would just say just be cautionary. There's some I've got some clients that do it and they do it really well. They've nailed the numbers. They under they have a team in place. Um, you know, I had one of my favourite students um, right at the beginning, uh, Russell. He was like, you know. I just work for the council and I'm 55 and I just, I'm not smart enough to do anything other than follow the bouncing ball. Tell me what to do for the next step and tell me what to do. And he bought this property in Preston. You know, he did like a, it was straight, it was actually an Australian property investor magazine, which made me think that you're Australian property investors is API. Pro, yeah, API well, yeah. magazine. You can't turn it to an acronym. <laughs> yeah. And, but he, um, he like bought, he took his long service leave. He did like this, in 10 days did like a $17,000 renovation and had uplift of $70,000. Like for him, that was extraordinary. But between 2016 or 2014, 2018, he had $250,000 in uplift in value. And in the last three years, he's had that again. So it's like, yes, he made a substantial amount of money for that renovation and could tap in and then bought another property in Brisbane and did it again. But the growth that he's had, a half a million dollars compared to that original, I mean, that's where the money was. And that's what people give up where when they start flipping. And and mm -hmm. that's where that's, you know, growth is cash flow is going to let you keep holding your property. So cash flow is very important and it's, it's fantastic at the moment, right? Because in most of us, you know, our properties pay for themselves. Um, but um, yeah, when it's we so true. Growth, it it's lets so, you retire. It's so my renovation that I did in to, uh, the start of 2020 um, grew um, the same amount in 2021 by capital growth. So, like, it's like doing a reno, getting the reno uplift, and That's then fun. the capital growth does its own reno for you. And if I, I sold know. that thing, I've just paid, in, like, another – because where am I going to put that money? I'm going to put it into another deal anyway, so I've got to rebuy into the property that I want to buy, and then I paid selling costs, and then I've got I stamp know. duty, and then capital gains tax. Yeah. It's just one of those things that you need to think and about. And if the market right? catches you out in the middle of that, you know, and it starts declining, you're losing everything. I mean, I had a, a past student call me. Carl called me on Monday and he said, has your, has your course changed? I said, what do you mean has it changed? And he said, oh, I bought it like eight years ago. I said, well, there's some things like suburbs, Lexus software or things that change, but pretty much nothing changes like it's just the fundamentals buy a good quality property in a good quality area with pricing disparity do a good quality renovation that fits the market do it on budget on time and he said are you still telling people to buy i uh, use uh, in the color schemes antique white and i said yes he said that's good because all of my houses and all of my investment properties are antique white and he's, he actually said the investment the initial investment saved him twenty thousand dollars on the negotiation tips um, of buying the course and it, it, you don't I guess the thing is you don't really know when you're buying a property or you're renovating where the money's going to be made you know and you're hoping and dreaming and I just think you should take the hoping and dreaming out buy below the market or know how to negotiate well to buy the property you want now rather than pay more for it as the property prices go up exponentially like they are at the moment 
buy a property that has that renovation potential. So you've got that growth, the vacancy rates reduce, the rent goes up and then buy for the growth, you know, make money in three ways. Mm -hmm. Are there any like hard no's when you're looking at a renovation? Like are there any things that you look at when you're doing a renovation and, and then all of a sudden it's got the trident and then all of a sudden X pops up or something pops up and you're like, oh, there you go. Sorry, can't do it. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're always learning, right? So I remember doing a renovation in Eastern Suburbs in Sydney and I was walking through the lounge room and the electrician said to me, it'd be easier having dimmer, uh, dimmer lights, wouldn't it? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then all of a sudden I've got like 40 dimmer lights throughout the house and I've got a bill for $2,000. I'm like, what the hell? Like that was like, you know, that was just like an off comment. And in the same property, the plumber came in and said, you know, that toilet out the back in the laundry, it's going to ground. It's not even connected to sewage. And I was like, oh, my God, we have to connect it to sewage. And we're pulling up concrete and we're putting in the sewage lines. I'm like, yay, like I solved this. Where if I didn't I get, get in my head and in that, and I actually stood back and said, well, do I need a second toilet? The answer was no. Yeah. And I spent $8,000 on putting in a toilet that I didn't really need. And I think... You know, when I think about, and I was really trying to hack in the last year the characteristics of successful investors and what I could find that they had in common and, you know, where they actually operate. Actually, I've got a slide on this. Can I show you my slide? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> well, I th it's revolutionary to me, right? And I've been doing this for a while going, why do some people succeed and some don't? I don't get it. Okay, you can see my screen. Uh, yep. Almost, almost. Okay, so where is this? I've got this beautiful slide. Dun dun dun. Okay, this one. There we go. <laughs> okay, so if you think about action here, inaction and action, right? And you've got knowledge and ignorance. There's a lot of people that are just gamblers. They're like they're jumping on every single deal. Like, did you hear about? NRAS and NDIS and buying the US and flipping in New Zealand and da, 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 da. and they you know, they're the most excitable people at any conference you see and they they're in the corner coming up with and there's this crypto thing and we're going to buy decentralized land or whatever it's called yeah decentralized exactly. no knowledge no research so this they're, they're sitting down here sometimes it works and you're going to hear about the big fish they got you're not going to hear about some of the flips that failed right and then you've got the dreamers and these these are like loving these people. They they just, you know, they they talk a lot and they do a lot of courses and they tell their friends who've done courses and everyone else goes and does the course. And, you know, they, they're the people on, you know, the Facebook groups that just give the most amazing, insightful information. And you're like, wow, wisdom bomb. Like I'm so, I'm so lucky they're here in my group, but they haven't ever bought anything. They haven't taken action, you know. They're just down here and, you know, they've got this whole knowledge thing. And so they're sitting there. Here, here we have the cynics. The cynics are they don't know anything but they think they know everything and they're never going to do anything. And unfortunately these are a lot of our family members and they only are cynics because they're trying to protect us. And, you know, there is a whole lot of mindset around the um there's a fear of success for a lot of people. And one of, I was speaking with one of my mentoring clients two weeks ago. I was like, I've, I've worked out the suburbs for you. I've set up the alerts. Why are you not pulling the trigger? Let's work on this. What is happening? And she just said, I think I've got an issue with my relationship with success. And I said, okay, let's sit in that. Let's, let's define what success means to you. And she said, it's a little old lady dying alone in a mansion. I'm like, well, no wonder you don't want that. Let's redefine success. What success look to you when you're being very, you know, very abundant in your thinking? She's like, well, I have time to spend with people. You know, to your point, Jeff, time, right? It's a, it's a currency. I can be generous with my time and spend time with people I want, when I want, how I want. Nothing to do with money. And it just redefined the entire experience and she's off buying a property. So, you know, what I found is that people have got a clear framework of exactly what they want. They have a clear vision. They understand also, you know, they're conscious of what they're doing. They're not trying to be 
you know, I want five properties or I want a $100,000 passive income. They're very clear on on what they're trying to do. And mostly they've, they've got a bigger passion project or commitment to community or family of what they want to create. They're the people who are these in, incredible achievers. And I, you know, I mm-hmm. think that, you know, often what we have is, you know, everyone's kind of like the, the, the loop. They've got this plan of how do I, you know, get to the goal. And the reality is, you know, we do get confused with all of these things and we just fall short because we lose our focus. And what we have to do is understand what that vision is, be very, very clear on the knowledge that you need and the resources to get to the vision, and then audit your current resources. Understand your, your you know, where your super is and where your investments are, where your home is, what your future home looks like, how much your future life is going to cost you, and then bridge that gap. Understand those those um, limitations and take action towards it. And I think, you know, when we kind of look at, when I look at what people have done to succeed in my community and, you know, I've community, I've built a community of over 30,000 people. Like I get to see what people are doing right and wrong. Mm. Yeah. And, but it's also like the roadmap to be able to know where to go and what the right steps are. And taking the right um, twist. There's and no turn right because... step. There. Any 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 step can work. It's just a case of actually understanding it, having the knowledge of the one. Yeah. Because and trying I, trying, I to, trying to trying to to your point, Joe. There is a there is others that success leaves clues, right? So others have been successful. They've left some clues of the path, and that's what why I was really keen in the beginning to look at what people had done wrong and just, you know, hack not doing that. And and I think, you know, everyone, you know, to your point, Jeff, there's everyone has kind of a, a path that they think is the right way and it might be right for them and it's just defining what that is and not being, you know, completely, um, you know, my way or highway. You know, what works for me with renovation is not going to work for other people. I've renovated remotely. You know, I had my I had a property in Sydney that I renovated in 2019 re- completely remotely and chose everything online, you know, had people doing video calls with me at the end of the day and knew where the projects were and I had all the quotes being done. You know, it's possible to do that. You don't have to be the, the hammer person. Yeah, I, I would like, lo- yeah. Because I did a renovation and I went there and, and set it all up. Um, and then I went on holiday to the UK um, and it, it all went very, very smoothly. I, I mean, it did get broken into a couple of times, but that's because I got it everything was, delivered. Was, Lessons learned. It was an expensive lesson. Don't get everything delivered and not have the curtains up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but but how, how how do you do that? I mean, what does it look like to do? It is sorry, is it possible? And I, I guess the answer is we've made it clear. Yes, it is possible to do a full remote reno. But um, yeah, how challenging is it to to, um, to be able to do that? These days, there's a lot of online asset managers that are disrupting the property management space. And the current uh, property management groups are trying to do things that are setting them apart. And a lot of those groups in the last few years have got like a a project manager, renovation expert kind of on call. And um, unfortunately, I didn't have that with the company I was working with, but I had spoken to the agent and said, can we put a lockbox on the front? I need three quotes for carpet, three for painting. She organised the people that she she would come up with two people and I'd come up with one person and they would just send me through the quotes. You know, I used my, um, I would chose the, the tiles that, you know, um, through the Renault Save card. I chose the um, flooring and the kitchen bench tops by just looking at, at places down here in Melbourne and getting it delivered up there. And I had a builder who kind of coordinated it all. Um, well, coordinate the kitchen and I had the agent who made sure that the painting and the carpet was done. And, you know, I had I had a guy doing the roof and at the end of the day he'd send me little updates with, you know, it's raining men playing in the background. You know, I was getting musical accompaniment to my, my renovation progress, which was great. But, you know, I, I was, I've always been the project manager on site, you know, and I was renovating a, a unit, a beachfront unit in, in 
um, Bondi and I'd be there at, you know, six o'clock in the morning sometimes or, you know, one in, actually one in the eastern suburbs, drove, a, drove over from our time and where we were rent vesting, living in a unit, let the the people in. I'd just have a whiteboard marker <laughs> and I'd write on the the window what we needed to have done for the day and who was doing what and the phone numbers of the subsequent person. So if the tiler didn't finish, he could let the kitchen guy know so that, you know, and they, they like you know, working out things themselves. And then I just built up a team. So if I had a really good tiler, I'd say, well, who have you worked with? What trades have you worked with that have been really good? And, you know, good people who clean up after themselves, do the job well, don't leave a mess for the next trade, you know, get things done on time. They like working together. So he'd say, oh, you have really got a, a great plumber or waterproofer, you know, and I'm like, great, can I have that person's number? And so you kind of, you know, I never had, there's some amazing renovators out there who, you know, have teams and they bring them into action. I'm kind of like the mum and dad renovator who, you know, does one at a time and and uh, puts together the team when I need it or does it remotely. And, you know, we we kind of done a duster. We're really good. We stopped renovating and buying or stopped buying. Many years ago, my husband retired at 40 and he paints now. He's no longer in IT and I just get to, you know, share, you know, how people can um, get to their their financial security in a way that I believe residential property can let them do it. So we have the choice to do what we want. And um, so we're not active and we don't have a team. And how I teach people to do it is is how I did it, which was, you know, sometimes you use the rental managers, sometimes you use the trades that you trust that, you know, can refer other people. There's ways of doing it remotely. And, um, you know, you don't have to be scared of buying a property in Adelaide or Dubbo and, you know, renovating it straight away. You know, you can keep your tenants in there and bank it and wait until we get over some of the craziness with the prices and, and distribution channels and renovate it then. Mm. I'm all for it. I, I, lo I love a good reno. I also think there's a space for like the, the like this a lot smaller renos. Like you don't have to do it the full whack. You can do like uh, you know people people are like no I I can't do. It. I was speaking to a friend and he's like no I can't do it. It's too, there's too much. I'm like all you're doing is getting someone to sand the floors and paint and replace some doorknobs. This is not rocket science. This is all pretty easy stuff that anyone can you can anyone can do by themselves and anyone can outsource by themselves. So yeah, it's it's a good point. We um when we were testing the course, we had 20 beta testers and half of them were really experienced investors. And I remember this guy, he has a policeman, I think he was in Tamworth, and he was a really successful um flipper, renovator, mm -hmm. and had done like 15 of them. And he got up to like module three, which essentially said you don't have to pull out the entire uh kitchen, you you might just need to change the the doorknobs and put on a new bench top. And he's like, oh my God, I was about to buy a new kitchen. That just saved me like eight grand. And I think sometimes it's like me in the toilet, like I had to fix the problem where in actual fact you step back and go, well, what are the comparable sales telling me? You know, what what is the standard of fixture and finish? What can I do now? What can wait? You know, I bought a little um, terrace in Darlington near Newtown in Sydney and I Every single cent went into that. You know, I pulled money out of one property, purchased it. I did not have, a, you know, a cent to renovate it at the time. Tenants were happy in there. They stayed there and every couple of years new tenants came. And it wasn't until like eight years later that I actually renovated, put in a skylight, did the you know kitchen, did the painting, did the floors and spent about 40 yeah. grand on it. I love it. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, um, we're hitting, uh, hitting, hitting uh, well over. You know, I mean, we're take, taking a heap of your time, Jane. Uh, I mean, there's heaps of things. So I, I, I put a put a call out about ten minutes ago that uh, for people for questions, any questions that people have, because I know there's there's people that've gotten heaps of value out of this. So uh, I'm sure Joe's always got questions. So, uh, but um, but before, I mean, well, I want to. I don't know. Maybe this might be a long one but i want to hear like a, a like a renovation have you got any renovation horror stories where people have gone about it and the wrong way and got in, themselves into a bit of strife um because they're the hard ones to hear about, right? Like we all hear about the victories because because everyone. Actually, I did. I used to run this like little um, uh, like pay it forward um, one day course in 
like Balmain TAFE or, or whatever it was, and people would turn up with renovation horror stories. And I remember <laughs> there, was, there was this one lady, they'd bought a house in Maroubra and they were going to flip it and and they had done all of what they thought, all the budgeting and research for it, and then they had to put in a retaining wall that they hadn't anticipated and they just hadn't considered, you know, doing getting the right people involved and asking questions about what was needed. And I think it cost them like $200,000 or something insane. And then the builder stopped. And when the builder stopped, they couldn't get another builder to come in and finish off the structural renovation. And so, because no one wants to take over the warranty insurance. So all of a sudden they're out of pocket and then the market started dropping as well. So at the end, you know, they fit, they finally, you know, had to go and get finance for someone that was charging a lot just to finish the job. They kind of didn't end up with any warranty insurance. It went over budget and then the market dropped. And so they could only just sell it for what they bought it for. So that was pretty heartbreaking. And then I had another um, student who turned up who talked about a story where they, I always doubt it when I can smell fresh paint when I go in to buy a property. I'm like, mm, what are they covering up? And in this, pro in this property, it was like the week after they had bought the property, this wall in the lounge room started separating and the house was actually falling apart and it had no structural integrity and they just kept patching it and painting it every week before before the uh, the open home. And, you know, caveat be aware of whatever it is. But, uh, yeah, they, uh, have it at mTOR, they uh, ended up having to get the property pushed back together and repinned that cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know, the pest and building inspection is really important. Doing all of the checks is really important. Actually, here's a little thing that I wasn't aware of. We bought our first property and then about 10 years later, a developer was developing a beautiful townhouse on the back of it. And about a week after we kind of signed off on all the changes to make sure it was livable for us and shadow lines or whatever that was, they came back and said, by the way, your fence is, is here's our boundary and your fence is this side of the boundary. We're claiming this land. So they claimed about $15,000 worth of our land because the fence had been in the wrong place for over 10 years. It's like, what? And I was like, and who gets a survey done right before they buy a property to go, is my land on the right, uh, is, is my fence line on the right place? So, yeah, um, renovation stories that I know where people really get it wrong is usually they just blow their budget and their time frame and they start renovating to their own tastes and, you know, yeah. they, um, they're they not renovating to the market. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They buy the $400 taps and the $800 this and where it, you know, I, I think someone, someone said it really good before um, that you don't buy the cheapest, but you buy the next step up. <laughs> and that is what, what looks a little bit better. That's how people sell wine in restaurants, right? <laughs> you don't want to show your date you're buying the cheapest, but you don't want to like fork out for the most. So you go for the next step up. <laughs> One so just back to dating, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Cool. Well, let's jump. Let's jump into the comments. Um, and we can. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so Aaron, Aaron asked a question. He said, "Can, can give us some tips on what rooms fittings we should focus on." I mean, I, I, I think I know a couple, but uh, interesting. Your thoughts, Jane? You've done it. Aaron, it's just back to the dating again. So first impressions. So you know, making sure that first impression really counts you know, that the lawn is mowed. So, for instance, when we had the valuer come to value one of our properties, my husband went and um, mowed all of the street. Everyone got their lawns mowed up and down the street. So as you came into the street, everything looked beautiful. Uh, so first impressions count. First impressions, That's including good. the makeup, which is the paint, right? So paint is a, a great way to lift a space. Mm -hmm. And there's a few little painting tricks, like if you've got a, a, um, a really dark entry entryway, do a half strength of the colour that you've got in the rest of the property to lift it and make it lighter. Um, and then you've got the heart of the home, where you're going to spend the most time, and that's the kitchen. So, you know, you're creating that space that is open and welcoming. And there's ways to, you know, for instance, I couldn't, for one of my renovations, I really didn't want to spend a lot on a great big glass splashback 
but I could get little fire rated uh, glass tiles and I could do the entire kitchen with that and pick up that accent in the bathroom. So the bathrooms are obviously another place um, you can really add a bit of wow. And just be aware that, you know, your bathroom is probably half the size or a third of the size of the kitchen, but often costs as much just because the waterproofing and the, the tiling maybe to the ceiling to give that luxe look um, and some of the nice little, you know, maybe it's a frameless shower uh, screen or, or whatever, but just be aware that there's those things going on. And, you know, there's also ways that you can save money and you can, uh, I'm not supposed to say about this, but there's like secret builder's back rooms at Bunnings that you can make an appointment and they've got another 100,000 products that are set up and they have all of these rooms set up that you can just go and look at and go, I want that. So, but I can't talk about what? that. What I can't. Mean? Bunnings hasn't got a back room. room. I know. I do just oh, found out no. about it. There's one yeah, in Sydney. I, 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 I just want to ask the store manager and say, I, I want to know about the builders. But you've only just you just have to make an appointment. Yeah. You have to make an yeah. appointment. So, wow. but, uh, and so it's essentially you choose, you choose your product, you tell them, you show them your plan, <clears throat> they will, they will cost it up. And we're talking eight to 12% below the price of, you know, the normal products, you're basically getting the um, builder's pack. So there's so many ways that you can actually get really nice fixtures and fittings. And I remember taking a valuer through a property and I was saying, oh, you know, look at these Italian mosaic tiles and they're beautiful tiles. Now, they didn't come from Italy, but they were Italian look. And, you know, that's how they sold them at the tile place to me. But they weren't like 50 bucks a square metre. They was $15 a square metre. And they looked fantastic. And he was impressed. And I was impressed that he was impressed. And the price reflected what he gave. So, yeah, <laughs> I think um, fixtures and fittings, it's where you can just, it, it's a little, the blings. But, you know, Aaron, I would just say first impressions, painting, kitchen, bathroom. <laughs> oh, good old Pleasy. Please, please loving the uh, loving the comments. But he um, he he asked, he asked a question. Thoughts on mm. thoughts on retaining roof tiles the quick way. I think mean, that's an interesting one. Have you ever done that? No, I but like. I did see one of uh, Steve. You probably saw the same thing. I saw this renovation show, and they're like they actually painted the corrugated iron mm -hmm. roof silver so they could cover up the rust. To sell it, and I was like, "Oh, it's just a rough little bit it, like it yeah, um, painting roof tiles." I guess if it's the right uh, type of paint that had the durability that was necessary to make it look a bit cleaner, because I know some of the roof tiles can look, uh, you know, especially when they're that old kind of orangey terracotta look. You can always lift a property by you know going sometimes with that the darker kind of um, more expensive look. It's not something I've ever done, Steve, but um, I'd be I'd be interested in hearing if you do it, how it works out. I've, yeah, painted, well, I've painted tiles in bathrooms. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like the tile paint works fantastically that's well. Great. Yeah. That's a great affordable way, right? Rather than ripping out all the tiles in the bathroom and having to re-waterproof yeah. everything because you tear all of that, you can just literally have the, the old gross yellow tiles or crazy colours that the previous uh, owner had yeah. and just paint them all gloss white. And it yep. looks amazing. And get the get the pink um bath repainted too, recoded. Eight hundred dollars. Get it well, yep. it won't be if you you can get it done by people that do it and well so this is the thing, like you, you get someone well. you could get someone to coat the bath and you're like, whatever it is, eight hundred dollars. And you're like, Well, you know, you could get one of those nice new baths, they're only three hundred bucks, but then you have to pull it out, dispose of it. You've got to repaint, retile around it. There's always, you know, doesn't always match. You've got to build the hob, you know, and all of a sudden it's at $1,500 and that $300 bath that's now, you know, cost you a fortune. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, look, we got an answer as well. Um, so he's done, he's done it a couple of times. You only get so about he was 10 testing years. me. <laughs> yeah, no, he's like it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's that's money well spent, right? Why retile a whole plot property if it's that's expensive? Yeah. Oh yeah, I love it. Um, okay, well, we've been talking about this course for for a little bit. Um, I'd like, can you give me a bit more detail on it? How it all how it all works? Because um, because I saw some yeah. awesome software that you get access to, and um, yeah, give us a bit of a rundown. I have to say, you know, the ultimate guide to renovation was really the 
the pinnacle of everything that I've done. And, you know, between us, people think they want to flip and they think they want to renovate. And I'm like, I really, I need to sell them what they want, but I really need to give them what they need. And so it was so important to me that people were buying in the right area. They understood the fundamentals of their strategy. They understand the dynamics and the, the demographics of the suburbs they're buying in. They understand the pricing pressure. So I've got a 12 module course and a lot of the time people are like, can I just jump to like module seven with the renovation stuff? I don't want to do all the fluffy stuff beforehand. I'm like, look, I'm sorry. I, you know, I've been to the States. I've learned best adult education techniques. You need to go through this one at a time because I really want this stuff to land for you so you have the information. And yeah. even the most experienced that renovators have gone through, I've gone, you know, that first like module on just the goal setting and the strategy, like that blew my mind. It actually refocus where I need to go. And it's so important to me because that's where I see successful investors, right? Having that yeah. vision. Um, so it's a 12 module course. It's usually, you know, I really wanted to make it half the price of all the other renovation courses that were on the market at the time. Um, because I really you know, am committed to that, making it realistically priced for everyday Australians to get the right information. Um, over the years, as I said, I used to have this spreadsheet that said, go and get the information from here, 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 and do the suburb analysis. Now um, the suburb selector software and the location master clause is, is included in it. So that um, information is updated every single month. So if you buy the location masterclass, I think it's $995 a year. If you buy the location, if you buy Ultimate Guide to Renovation, you've got it, well, for as long as I'm living, for life. But the suburb flex software is in there <laughs> always. Um, and, you know, just little things like the quick quote calculator, you know, it was really hard to quote out per room or per job how much things are going to be. So we created a calculator that John, the co-creator, has actually used for development. So we've got a structural and a cosmetic one. Down to the, the extent of saying, you know, what, what size trees, what size plants are you going to have? And so we've got all the different plants and the different costs. If you have a fully grown wow. one or a half grown one or a full grown one, down to painting the room, you can go, it's this much per square metre or this is the quote for it down to I need five cans of four litre paint and three lots of builder's bog. So everything's priced in depending on how much detail you want to go into. Um, wow. And then there's a four-step checklist that we've used time and time again to assess properties, assess the areas, assess the demographics, ask the right questions to the agents, real estate agent templates to give them and buyer's agent templates. You know, for me, it was making sure that everyone had all the information that they needed and then the support I've been running monthly calls in the, in the Your Property Success Club Facebook group for the last eight years. And a lot of people who come in actually go back and listen to all the calls because there really isn't much new, you know, around how we do things fundamentally and make money in property. And, um, you know, for me, it was really important to add that kind of support as well. So the ultimate guide to renovation, um, I took it off the market early last year because I felt that there was a lot of people to being off opportunistic in selling courses to people stuck in lockdown <laughs> and I have to be honest with you I got a little lazy and I didn't even let anyone buy it for the last two years so when <laughs> um, I was thinking about you know when you asked me to talk about renovation and I was thinking about your community and, and you know, how much love you give them I really you know would love to make that available to them and it's usually not $2,997 and okay. um, I'm going to take a thousand dollars off so it's wow. going to be $1,997. You get the quick quote calculator, you get all the checklists, all the templates and the location masterclass course and the suburb selector software that's updated with SQM research data every single month. See, Jeff and I have actually spent like probably $50,000 each on our, on our education. And um, what I kind of found was like you wouldn't have one course that could do a whole it wouldn't do it wouldn't do it wouldn't yeah. give you the location and the the suburb research it would just be renovation right it would just be this is how you do the renovation thing and then you've got other ones that are just development but it sound by the sounds of this one you're actually going from right from the beginning of setting up your mind your, your mindset um laying out exactly who you are where you want to go mm -hmm. and then painting the picture of how you're going to get there and then mm. giving you the tools and the renovation to, well, the tools to find those assets and find the locations. Um, that's amazing. And 
after spending 50 grand, I do much prefer to spend well, under 2000 for all that. <laughs> exactly. And I have to tell you, it's, um, it's not, a, a, it is not a uh, development. So I definitely, that's not my yeah. wheelhouse. I'm yeah, not, yeah, yeah. I'm not in that, even though John's used the quick, quick calculator to do his entire development. That's not my wheelhouse. I, I stick to what I know and teach what I know. Um, but what he did do, which I think is genius, I think I can, do you want to have a quick little look at it? Okay. Yep. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great okay. thing about this. We get a, we get behind the scenes. I know. <laughs> Everyone else board can leave and we can just play. <laughs> <laughs> yep. okay. I'm going to drop the link um, because you've been kind enough to even create this this cool link for us. Yeah, sure. well, that's the discount, so don't go to the main website. Can you guys see that yet? My screen. Oh, that's, that's not that's not the discount. Oh, yeah, here we go. It's coming. Okay, so this is what the ultimate guide to renovation looks like, right? So the reason that I'm really excited about this, so we've got all the modules. You know, there I'm having a chat. I told you it was a few years ago, right? And so, you know, there's the whole goal setting and I've got them in really small little videos so that you can download them if you need to, listen to them on MP3s, you know, watch them, whatever. And so this this whole section here, you know, there's just all of that kind of gold about the location and, and finding the properties and how to do it and every single step is covered. And then, you know, you've got the location masterclass workbook and how to fill that in. And then we walk through and have a look at the renovations and what uh, you could be doing. So there's all of this kind of, oh, look, there you go, elite marketers talking there to me, um, how properties are sold and the negotiation plan. But there's all of the templates that I've got in here as well. But what is really cool, so John um, came up with this uh, structural renovation yes, um, technique, which is this box in the back. And essentially what it does is it uses a commercial property design that allows you for properties that have like that annex that you want to push over and put in the butler's pantry, the lovely you know kitchen and living space. We've actually got the blueprints for those that you can take to your architect. Now, this is really quick to do and wow. because you're not actually creating and, like, you've got beautiful, this is the renovation that he did on the structural one. So you've got these beautiful um, uh, renovations and what, did you put that link in there? Because I could I just, did. okay, let me have a look at that because I can just bring that up because the, um one of the things that you'll see is that if you want to, you can go and have a look at this reno uh, one of the renovations that we did. So if you go, <laughs> if you go in there, look at this, <laughs> show me the offer. But if you go in there, there's actually four videos of us renovating one of these properties. But the really interesting thing is that, you know, if you have a look at these um, blueprints, it costs about ninety to hundred thousand to put in, in within just a few weeks that box in the back, and then you fit it out with another twenty to thirty thousand. But this allows you to go and take as a kind of like a posi strut um, that is used here. That means that you don't actually put have to put on a whole big roof line. It's actually a flat roof, and you're actually getting a really nice de design. So. You get everything basically in in that um, course, and I, you know, the reason I put it together is it's it's kind of the combination of everything that I love and everything that you know I I really like doing. So, so yeah, it's um it it gives me the opportunity to be able to do that for people. So where is that little slide? I put that together so you can have a look. But that's where those videos are. If you just go and put your name in there. Um, click on that link, you can actually watch the, I do, I walk through a renovation from purchasing it all the way through and talk about it. But yeah, Amazing. you guys, um, and I've even put in, because I know, you know, it's Christmas. Um, I think I put in, what was it? Uh, six payments of $397. If you don't like it in 30 days, oh. give it back. You get one one module uh, a week. And so it's definitely drip fed to you so that you actually consume it in the way it's supposed to be consumed just like adele and spotify and uh yeah <laughs> fantastic okay well there you go i've been out a lot of music recently i've noticed uh, she's come, <laughs> come back yeah yeah so and she likes things done her way but you know it's um 
module two and three will get people into that suburb selector software. They can really play around with that and start doing that diligence and running suburbs against each other. And, you know, that is going to make the people money that the capital growth and the renovation is going to give them the uplift um, in the future. Mm. So I, I just, you know, it's a strategy yeah. that just works. It just works and it just works. Yeah, and this is the thing, right? Like um, a buyer's agent is ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. You're saving, you know, saving twenty thousand dollars on a renovation on a negotiation is twenty thousand dollars saved, right? So a, a small, like two thousand dollars, uh, under two thousand dollars is awesome. So it's well, a, and so it's this is the thing. When I was talking to Carl, when he was like, "Are you still using that same color?" I'm like, "Yep." And, uh, and mind you, under the kickboards of all of my kitchens, I have a little pot of that colour. So if I go and do an inspection and there's something that needs done, I've got a little sample of the colour and I've got the, the, the paintbrush. So, you know, it's like my first car. It was a Kingswood straight red engine. I knew if I turned up in any garage across Australia, I could say, can you help me out? And they knew how to help me out. So if you have a basic colour, it all works. And it works for years. But... Um, when I was talking to Carl and he was talking about, you know, it saved him that much just on the negotiation. I was like, well, how did the property, how did the renovation turn out? It's like, well, I bought for three thirty, and now it's worth six thirty. dollars I'm like, yay, you, six years, good job, you know, and that's, that's what happens when you buy in good quality areas. You buy for the market, you have less rent vacancies and it allows you to get on and do something else. He's now looking to put a granny flat on the back of it, like happy mm. days, you know, so he can add yeah. even more value. Yeah, and and this is what people want, right? Like when it comes to quality assets, if you're if you're, um, you can buy something that doesn't look like a quality asset, and then relist it after you've done the renovation to make it a quality asset that people actually want to live in it, hold it for the long term, or pass it on, or whatever. Mm. But if it looks fantastic, people are going to be emotionally invested and want to put higher higher rates on. And also, if you're looking to sell your own property. You're going to want to understand renovation and stuff. So well, love we it. had one of the students who was had just been quoted two hundred fifty thousand to do a renovation on his own home, and when he dropped in and saw the box on the back blueprints, he used those and cut a hundred thousand dollars off his cost on his own home. And to your point, <laughs> Jeff, more people are doing renovations. A lot of people staying put at the moment. They can't get into the market. Kids are getting older. They wanted to upgrade. The market's gone crazy. They're saying, okay, let's put on an extra story. Let's do something. Let's put on the box at the back. Let's renovate our own home. And people mm. can do it in place a lot easier these days by doing it a little bit at a time as they can afford it, you know. So, And I'm also going to throw in that a free reno save card. Like seriously, if, if you don't buy the course, just go and buy the card. I think it's like $99 a year or something and just the discounts that it can get you. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thousands. Gold, gold right, right to the end. Um, Love I, it. I, I, wanted, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to say thanks for spending more than two hours with us on on the call, Jane. Just the the amount of um, sort of the amount of longevity you spent on a standing industry because it, it is a tough and uh, tough industry to be in, and and just the value you've added over time, time and time again, and just the energy that you bring as well. So thank thank you for not just thank in Oz property, but just everywhere that you that you, um, you you are gold. It's funny. Um... I um, I remember Effie, who was the editor of Money Magazine, when she, when, she needed a comment, when she needed a comment, she used to call me up and go, Jane, I need, you, I need your meats and meat and potatoes. You, you don't go offline. You don't change the story. You haven't changed the story in 15 years. I just need the meat and potatoes. And, and that's what it is, meat and potatoes. That's what most Australians want, right? They just want the typical property in the typical area where they want to live. We get the benefit of our creating a better use of it by renovating it and, you know, keeping our tenants for longer and getting us an equity growth that allows us to live the dream. And it keeps going, keeps going, just keeps growing every cycle. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jane, for taking the time. Is there any other kind of final things that you wanted to cover off that, that we haven't covered? No, just everyone have a safe and happy holidays. And, uh, you know, 2022 is going to be really exciting and there's going to be lots of opportunity. But just remember, you know, listen to all the information. Don't just take one piece of news. You're investing for the long term, 10 to 15 years. You know, this is not like a, a one hit wonder because those who are in for the one hit wonders often, you know, get themselves into a lot of trouble. And, you know, just, you know, have a, a safe and, and happy time with your family. Love it. Thank you. Let's end on that.
Let's go buy a property. See you guys. <laughs>